Good morning and welcome to Frankenmuth Bible Church. Uh, for those of you who are visiting this morning, my name is Spencer Smith, and I have the privilege and the honor of serving here as the youth pastor over the past eight months. And I proclaim to you this morning that you are loved by God, that you are cherished by this church, and that in any moment in your life, you can receive the free gift of grace that we have found in Christ Jesus. Now, over the past couple weeks, uh, we've been in a sermon series on the Trinity. In the first week, Pastor Joseph talked about uh, the history of the Trinity and what it is and what it is not. And then Pastor Randy came and he talked about the various aspects of God the Father, of the Son, and then the Holy Spirit. And then last week, Nate came and he preached on God the Father as divine. But this week I have the honor of coming and talking about God the Father as distinct. God the Father as distinct in his relationship to the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so in order to start the conversation this morning, I want to ask a very difficult question, but it's a very uh, honest question that we have to answer. And that is, has God the Father abandoned the world? Has God the Father abandoned the world? For some of you this morning, you might be thinking, yeah, because I am going through all these different things in my life, and I feel like he has abandoned me. And maybe for others, as you turn on the television, you hear about wars and genocide, you stop and say, God, where are you? What are you doing? And so as we answer this question this morning, uh, I started to chew on how to answer it with an illustration. And one of my favorite movies that I ever have seen, and it was the first movie I ever saw on DVD back in the day, which some of you who are younger are like, wow, you're really old. And then I'm sure some of you are like, wow, you're a baby. Yes. Was Finding Nemo. Fisher friends, not food. As a fisherman, that's a complete lie, personally, for me. But uh, in this movie... It's a story about a clownfish named Marlin and his only son, Nemo. And what happens is that uh, his wife dies by a barracuda accident. And so Nemo is doing all that he can to protect his son because he doesn't want him to swim out into the deep because it's a dangerous world out there. And so in one of the first scenes, Nemo, in front of his friends, says to his dad, I hate you. Dad, I hate you. And he deliberately disobeys Marlin, and before we know it, he is picked up by a scuba diver and whisked across the ocean and placed in a fish tank as a pet. And so uh, this morning, as I'm preaching, we're going to uh, look at how not only is God transcendent as he is divine, that he is above this material world, but that he is also imminent. He wants to have a relationship with us. He is active. He has not abandoned us. When Pastor Randy preached a couple weeks ago, he met something called deism, which is the false reality that God started the world, man messed it up, and God said, see you later. Good luck. But God wants to be with us, and we know that he wants to be with us because He has called us his sons and daughters, and we are able to call him our father. No other religion in the world calls God their father, except Christianity, except the truthful words of Scripture. And so that is how he is distinct in his relationship with his son Jesus and the Holy Spirit, because he is our father. And so before I dive into it this morning, I'm just going to pray for help. (laughs) Dear Heavenly Father, help. (laughs) I can't do it. I can't convince these people that you're their father, that you love them. But you can. 
Speak to our hearts. Speak truthfully. Soften us. Help us to see the grand story of Scripture so that we can leave this place assuredly knowing that you are our Father and we have been bought with a price. We believe that you can do it. And I pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Now, being a Christian, we innately, naturally talk about Jesus because Christian literally means little Christ. But a lot of times uh, we talk about God the Father in casual conversations or in prayers. And even as Jesus said, pray to God this way, our Father who art in heaven. And so uh, we come and we place God the Father out in the distance in this mysterious place alongside the Holy Spirit, and we just kind of know a little bit about him. And so it's very important for us uh, to see a couple things, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the whole story of the Old Testament this morning. Some of you are laughing because you know that's pretty absurd. Yes, I'm going to fly through it. I'm not going to tell you every story, but I hope that in telling you some of the stories, you can be inspired to go back and to read it for yourself. Because if we say we are Christians, it's because we know who Jesus is. But if we know who Jesus is, that means we have read the New Testament. And what I want to argue uh, uh, off to the side this morning is that you cannot understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. You cannot understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. You cannot know Jesus Christ as the Son of God without knowing who the Father is. And over the past month, I've been meeting with uh, a couple guys from church, and we've been reading the entire Bible together. And one of them has only been a Christian for a short time. And as we're going through it, I say, hey, like, what is it about? And each week, he nails it on the head. He says exactly what it is all about. Because when you read large portions of Scripture... It's very easy to understand because God is not a father where he has written a book just for us to be confused by it. That's not a God of love at all. And it's also important for us to not to uh, treat it like it's not a book because it's not like uh, we would go pick up our favorite book, maybe Lord of the Rings, off the shelf and just open it to chapter whatever and just start reading it and go off in all different directions. But know that we would start from the cover and go all the way through so that we can understand it. Because when we know that God is our Father in the Old Testament, that we understand the New Testament, and then we understand who Jesus is as the Son of God and how he has bought us with a price. And so uh, just a couple things to note before we dive into it, as we look at this relationship in the Old Testament as God our Father, that there's going to be disobedience and there's going to be discipline. Because what loving father does not discipline his children? Someday when I have kids and they just do whatever they want, if I truly love them, I'm going to be like, whew, time for a spanking. This is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. <laughs> just being honest. So we see this dichotomy in scripture of obedience and discipline as God is desiring for us to be his sons and daughters. But not only that, three points to think in the back of your mind that God has saved us from ourselves. God has saved us from ourselves. The second point is that God has saved us from himself. Because as Nate talked last week, that God is transcendent, he is holy, he is just, he is perfect. That he cannot allow sin to go on in this world without some form of punishment. He has saved us from himself. And finally, he has saved us for himself. Because he does want a relationship with us. So remember these sayings in the back of your mind as... I'm re-encountering or retelling the whole story of the Old Testament. 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And everything that we have seen in this world and the galaxy and the universe, he created for him and by him and through him. And he saw it and he saw that it was good. And he created man and woman in his own image and he walked with them in the garden and desired to be with them. And he told them, do not take from the tree of good and evil because if you take from that fruit and you eat it, then sin will enter into the world. And we know, as the story goes, they disobey. And because God is holy, since he is just, he cannot be in the presence of sin. And so he had to cast them outside of the garden. And in this moment, he has a decision to make. And he would have been perfectly justified with either one. But he could have struck them down dead because he is holy but he didn't because he wants a relationship with us. And so, in doing so, uh, he saved us from ourselves. He saved us from himself. And this is the point where he saved us for himself. And as they get kicked out of the garden, we see that the world becomes more and more evil, so much to the point where God says, I regret ever making mankind. I regret it. They are so evil. They are murdering one another. And God sees a man named Noah, and he says, okay, there is one righteous man left in the entire world. I want you to build an ark to save yourself because I have to wipe out all the sin, all the corruption in the world. I'm going to start over from scratch. And so he pours out his holy wrath on the entire world, And Noah's family is saved in the ark. And God places a rainbow in the sky saying, I will never destroy the world again by water. And unfortunately, Noah messes up. And the world continues to live in sin and they don't learn from their mistakes. And uh, the people of the world of the ancient Near East gather together and they say, we want to make our name great. So we're going to build up this Tower of Babel so that humanity can be above God, because we want to be our own gods. And God comes and he says, no, like that's not going to happen, because only my name is great. And so he scatters them across the entire world and gives them different languages. And we see that through the disobedience and the discipline that the plot gets stickier, it gets more complicated. How is God going to redeem the nations? How is he going to save the entire world now? Abraham. He looks at a man who is uh, going to be faithful in his obedience, and he says, Abraham, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm going to make a covenant to you that uh, someday your children are going to be as numerous as the stars, And the whole world is going to be blessed through your family so that they can return to the relationship that I desire with them. And not only that, that I'm going to promise them a land so that I can be with them. I could be their God and they could be my people. And I want you to circumcise yourself as a symbolism that you are my son and I am your father. And so uh, we see in the story of uh, Isaac that uh, God tells Abraham to come and sacrifice your only son as a test. And Abraham gets to the point where he's lifting up that knife and God says, stop. I see your obedience. And God provides a ram for him and a sacrifice that would later symbolize Jesus' sacrifice for us. But sin is still there, creeping around. Isaac grows up and he has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Esau's the older one, but Jacob deceives Isaac into receiving his inheritance. And we see throughout the story of Genesis that he is just a conniving little scoundrel, a little sneak. 
And he ends up having 12 sons with two different wives. And the youngest of the sons, it says that he liked him better than all the other sons. And so I've got brothers. I would never do this to my brothers, I hope. Um, But uh, so they get jealous and they're like, hey, let's kill him. And the oldest one was like, nope, we can make money off of this situation. Let's just sell him. And so they sell Joseph to some slave traders, and he is in captivity in Egypt for many, many years. But while he is there, God's sovereign hand is in control of each situation in his life, and he raises him up as second in command over all of Egypt. And it says in the Psalms that God came and he caused a great famine throughout the entire world so that he would force Joseph's older brothers to go down into Egypt to find food. And when they show up, they're like, oh boy, like, what happened? He's second in command. And we would think that he would go and he would enslave them or murder them and pay them back for what they had done to him. But Joseph bless his soul, does something that I couldn't have done. He says, you meant this for evil, but God has meant it for good. And so his brothers and family move down into Egypt, and they're not in the place where God wants them to be. And, and being there for 400 years, they start to multiply into the millions But the next Pharaoh that falls and the next one that rises forgets about Joseph and his family. And they stop and and he says, wow, they're too great. Let's enslave them. And so in enslaving them for hundreds and hundreds of years, they cry out to God, where are you? What are you doing? Have you abandoned us, Father? And he hears them. And Nate talked a little bit about the story of Moses last week. But God comes and he says, Moses, I need to use you to save my people. I got to fulfill my promises to my disobedient sons and daughters. And Moses, he has a couple excuses, but he says, okay, well, what is your name? And God says, my name is Yahweh. Or in other words, that I am God. I am number one. There is no other gods before me. I am all powerful. I am all knowledgeable. The whole ten yards. And so uh, Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, well, who is your God? And he responds, well, my God is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so Pharaoh just kind of coughs and is like, well, pfft. I've got my gods. And the story of the ten plagues is so awesome. It's so like, it's just straight up cool. Because what happens is that during that time, there were uh, pagan deities. And the Egyptians, some of you might know, were worshiping all kinds of different gods. They were worshiping the god of the Nile, the, the god of the sun, the god of whatever. They had thousands of them. And so much to the point where... Uh, Yahweh comes and says, no, like, I am the God of the Nile, and I'm going to prove it to you by turning it to blood. But Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And plague after plague, his heart becomes more and more hardened to the point where even the sun turns black. And Yahweh is over the sun. There is only one God. And so uh, Pharaoh is reluctant, and the people are freed, and they go to the Red Sea, but Pharaoh changed his mind like as many times as he's changed his toga, just keeps changing it, and he is wanting to kill them. And so God opens up the Red Sea, and they are saved through it. And the armies of Pharaoh crash and die. And they enter into the wilderness for 40 years. And as they are there, God is providing food and water for them. At this point, you would say or think, well, they've seen miracles. Of course they have faith. Of course they believe. But what do they do? 
they take the gold that they got from Egypt and they make a golden calf and they worship it. Absurd. Ridiculous. Disobedience. And so, uh, through disciplining them, God comes and says, no, like, you are going to be my son. And I forgot to mention this, that in uh, Exodus chapter 4, 22, it says this, Moses, say to Pharaoh, I am Yahweh. Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. And so we see this beginning of this relationship where God is the father, but yet they're disobedient. And so as they're being disobedient in the wilderness, he says, fine, I'm just going to let this generation pass by and none of you can enter the promised land. You're going to miss out on it. And so that happens. And even Moses isn't able to see it. It says that he was just looking in the distance and it was right there at his fingertips after hundreds of years of enslavement in Egypt and he misses out. And so God raises up another man, Joshua. And in uh, the book of Joshua, it's a, a wonderful book, but the very first story, we encounter a woman named Rahab who was a prostitute. And she comes, and she sees that the Israelites are coming, and she has heard 40 years later still stories about how Yahweh is the one true God, how he triumphed over the Egyptians. And she says, I believe I believe in God. And in Matthew chapter 1, we find out that Rahab was actually Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother. Jesus was related to a prostitute. But by her faith, she was able to enter into the family of God. And yet, Israel, the one who had seen all these miracles, continues in disobedience. It says that during those times that everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes and Israel had no king. And so they came to Yahweh and they said, yeah, uh (laughs) uh-oh. Took me a second. Um, And Israel had no king, Uh uh-oh. Um. Um, And so they say, we want to be like the other nations. All the other nations have their kings. And God's like, I thought I was your king. But God is reluctant and says, okay, fine. Like, I'll give you a king. And so he raises up King Saul. But King Saul doesn't listen to the men that come in and tell him what to do to the prophets. So much to the point where he starts practicing witchcraft. And then we see that as he is falling, God is raising up another anointed king named King David. And he is faithful. He is obedient to the point where people are shouting that Saul killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And everything is going well and to the point where one day he sees a woman bathing on a rooftop named Bathsheba. And because he's king, he can do what he wants. And so he sleeps with her. They conceive of a child. He tries to cover it up. And he even murders her husband. The one man who is so close messes up in the final chapter of his life. And his son, King Solomon, comes and he fails. He asked God for one thing, and that was to be wise. And yet he had thousands of wives. Thousands of them. And so we see that God is finally last straw. Last straw. I am not going to let my sons and daughters get away with defaming my name as they're supposed to declare me as I am their father to the nations. And so he splits the kingdom. And not only that, he sends prophets to speak truth and to foresee the future to say, hey, guess what? There's going to be a nation called Assyria and Babylon, and they're going to come, and they're going to enslave you and take away you away from this promised land. 
and I'm going to discipline you. And we see that one of the prophets in the book of Hosea, an intense illustration where God comes to this prophet and he says, Hosea, I want you to take a prostitute as a wife. Now, he's not asking Hosea to commit a sin because we all marry sinners. But he does this. Hosea follows through and marries a prostitute named Gomer. And the no surprise, she comes and she has affairs. She goes back to her old lifestyle of making money that way. And so God says, Hosea, go buy her back. Go find the man she's with tonight and outpay him and bring her back because she is your wife, you love her. You must be faithful to her despite her unfaithfulness to you. And the purpose of why uh, Yahweh of God the Father is giving this illustration with some intense uh, words going on, he says, this is like Israel who's played the whore. This is like my people who... I've done whatever they want. And at this moment in time, I'm going to stop with the narrative and just say, how many of us have seen in movies, been told by friends, family members, that if somebody hurts us, just pay them back. Find a way to get them back. Stab them in the back gossip about them, do whatever. But in this one moment in all of history where God would have been just to give up on his relationship with mankind who has played the harlot, he does the miraculous. He gives us his son, the greatest thing he could have given us. In the moment of all of history of being disobedient, Because when we look at this part of Scripture, this Old Testament right here, basically says you can't save yourself. You can't save yourself. You are going to be disobedient. And that is what it takes for us to see it time and time again, that not only is the story of the Old Testament just our story, but it's a story of God the Father wooing us back to Him. And we see this reflected in a story in Luke 15, verse 11 through 32. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them to read through this as I retell this story. Because can we go back to God after we have abandoned the relationship, after we've been disobedient sons and daughters? And to talk a little bit about the context, which is so very important, because uh, for those of you who have read this story or heard it before, that you know it as the prodigal son. But I have put prodigal sons, because it's not about just the one son. It's about both of them, but even more so the son that we see in the end. And so the context of chapter 15 is that Jesus is hanging out with all these sinners, tax collectors, prostitutes, no surprise there. And as he's doing so, the religious people of the day are saying, why are you doing this? Like, seriously? Come hang out with us cool kids. We got it all together. And so he comes and he tells two stories to drive home a point about things that have been lost, and things that have been redeemed. And he really nails it with the third one, with a real punch to the throat. And the story goes like this, where uh, a man had two sons, and the younger one comes and he says, Dad, give me your inheritance, which is before he should have given up. He should have died, and then he gets the inheritance. But he gives his son the inheritance, and he sells it all, and he leaves And it says that he goes and he squanders it. And we see later on in the text that Jesus, or the other son, accuses him of spending it all on prostitutes. 
And so uh, the story goes, and he loses all of his money, and there's a famine in the land, and he is eating among the pigs, which is a horrendous thing for a Jewish person to hear that. But even, I guess if anybody was eating with the pigs, it's a pretty low day. If I was eating with the pigs, I'd be like, okay, this is a new all-time low. Like, here we go. What happened? And so he stops and he says, I have sinned not only against my earthly father, but I have sinned against my heavenly father. I've got to go back. I got to believe in his grace. I got to believe in his mercy. And so as he is turning, the word for repentance means to turn from your ways. As he's turning, the story immediately goes to the father who is waiting in anticipation for his son to return to him so that he could be his father and he could be his son. And upon so, he sees him in the distance and he hugs him. He says, welcome home. Here's my robe. Here's the best calf that I have to order, offer to give you a feast. But in the background, we see the other son just sneering. Just, seriously? Like, I've been with you, dad, this whole time. I've been obedient. I've been the good, faithful son. And the purpose of the story is to show to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, hey, you should be rejoicing that God is preaching forgiveness to disobedient sons and daughters. But I share this story with you because it's so important for us to see that God is waiting for us to come back to him. God the Father is waiting for us to come back to him. My favorite scene in the movie Finding Nemo is that this pelican is talking to him in this dentist office and kind of a weird situation. If you see the movie, it makes sense. So (laughs) he's talking to him in uh, this aquarium and the pelican has heard all these stories about his dad, Marlin, trying to get back, fighting jellyfish, fighting off sharks, going through this minefield And as he's telling these stories to Nemo, he fades off into the background and the music gets a little bit louder and it zooms in on Nemo's face and you realize his father loves him still despite his obedience. His father is waiting for him to come on back. And so we've seen this dichotomy of disobedience and discipline. We've seen that God the Father has saved us from ourselves, from not being able to be good, from not being able to be obedient. We've seen that God has saved us from himself because he is holy, he is just, he is righteous. And because he wants to have a relationship with us, he has saved us for himself. And this is where I really struggled with how to make an application out of this because all these stories are so self-explanatory of how it comes back to us, to our disobedience. And this is where I will come to say a few things. I wonder if we have forgotten that God is our Father simply put, because we stopped reading the Old Testament. To see that despite our disobedience as sons and daughters, that he's still pursuing us, he still loves us. And if this morning you think, God doesn't love me, he doesn't pursue me, then I'm telling you that you are in this place right now to hear these very words, that God is your father, he loves you, he cares for you, he wants you to come home, he is waiting for you to simply turn because he's wanting to run to you. I wonder if we have forgotten God as our father because we have fathers who have failed us. Over the past seven months, I've gotten to know a lot of beautiful families here. And I've heard stories of dads who loved a bottle more than their kids dads who were not faithful to mom. All these stuff that just breaks my heart as a youth pastor. 
And so how can I come and say, and how can you hear me say that God the Father loves you when all you're thinking in the back of your mind is, he doesn't love me because my own dad didn't love me. My own dad didn't love me. But I'm telling you right now that the history of the Bible and the evidence of the church is to show you, no, that your Father in heaven loves you despite what has happened. He loves you. And some of you need to forgive some of the things that your dad did. Maybe he didn't do. Maybe he passed away before you ever heard him say, I love you. It breaks my heart because I don't, I thought I already cried enough for the first service, but I don't know who my grandpa was. I don't know who my dad's dad was. All I know about him is that he was an alcoholic. But praise God that my earthly father came and he saw God as his father and how he pursued him in his own personal disobedience. And he said, I want you to go to my dad and buy him for a price that he told Jesus, his son, to do that. That he broke the chain of sin so that my dad... I know he loves me, and I know that I love him. Our fathers are called to be the evidence of our Heavenly Father's love for us. I know I'm not going to be the perfect dad, but in those moments, I'm going to say, hey, Harper, I messed up. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me like the Heavenly Father has forgiven me? And as a youth pastor, I hear so many kids all the time just talking about their broken relationships with their dads. And it hurts. Because if you tell me your relationship, about your relationship with your dad, I can tell you about your relationship with the Heavenly Father. But believe, by God's grace, that you can break that cycle. And as a youth pastor, I have to stop and say, the world doesn't need more youth pastors. The world doesn't need more youth pastors. It needs more dads. To be dads, to be spiritual leaders in the home, to say, I love you at whatever cost. I believe that as we call God our Heavenly Father, and we understand this relationship that we have with him, that the world would look on us in just complete confusion and to say, wow, you do have a heavenly father. He does have a son that paid a price, that bought you back. And it's interesting to know, I forgot to mention this in the first service, that even the son who obeyed, all of his uh, father's commands in the parable. He was in his father's house, but he did not love the things that his father loved. We ought to know the father so that we can love the things that he loves. And when we get to this point, we understand who Jesus is. We understand that when we believe in the power of his blood, that we are no longer children of wrath, but that we can be part of the family of God, found in Ephesians 2, 3. Or in Romans, as Paul says again, that we are now adopted into the family of God. We are his, and he is ours. Or in Galatians 3, 29, that we can be co-heirs because Jesus is the perfect son. We can inherit inherit all of his father's wealth of salvation. And I ask you this morning, do you believe that God is your heavenly father and that he desires goodness for you inside of his obedience? Are you growing as a child of his in faith? Or are you sitting in the dirt making mud pies with lesser things than what he wants for you? Have you given up the bottle of milk and desired to have meat in your life in order to grow by reading his word? 
Has God abandoned the world? No. He's just waiting for his sons and daughters to return, to be part of his family. These are God's words written for you, his sons and daughters. Do you believe them? Let's pray. God, I thank you for loving us while we were still sinners and knowing that despite our unfaithfulness, you have been faithful, that you have given us the greatest thing that you could have thought of, and that was yourself in your son. And I ask that each and every one of us would come into an intimate relationship with you as our father, that Jesus died so that that relationship could be restored. And as we do so, I pray that we would know that as our Heavenly Father, that when we disobey, you will discipline us because you are a jealous God. I pray that we would be teachful in these things. That we, when we know you and we know your word in the Old Testament and what you've done, we can see the richness and the depth of the New Testament and see how beautiful it was that the Son laid down his life for us. We anticipate the return of your Son to take us home to you. But until then, we will proclaim your gospel to the world saying that we are your sons and daughters of God our Father. In Jesus' name, amen.